So welcome everyone officially to our spring lunch and learn. Um, I am certain that many, if not all of you are very familiar with our two esteemed panelists. So I will not belabor the introductions. Um, think of this more as an announcement. We are joined by Tasha Bell, Equity Manager for the Rock County Human Services Department, and Mark Perry, Executive Director of Community Action, Inc. of Rock and Walworth County. So thank you, both of you. Um, fun behind the scenes fact, when I emailed them and I'm like, I'm thinking about doing this, both of them responded right away and, and said I'm in, and I am deeply appreciative of that. Um, I am fortunate to call both of these individuals friends, and I'm really excited about this conversation. So to anyone who is just joining us, uh, we are asking that you keep your camera turned off until we reach the Q&A portion. If you have questions for our panelists, do not hesitate to put those into the chat. I will collect those and kind of monitor them. Um, and then once we reach the Q&A Q &A portion, we will definitely go back um, and answer as many of those as possible. So again, if you are not a panelist, we are asking that you go ahead and turn your camera off until the end of the event when we have our Q&A, and then we welcome all of you back on screen. All right, we are gonna jump in with our first question and I am gonna put it in the chat just so everyone in the audience is clear on the question. Um, we didn't decide order. So Mark, if you're okay, if we start with Tasha and I'll just flip flop um, as we go through the questions, I am getting a thumbs up, uh, perfect. Okay, so the first question. What would you share with individuals who believe that talking about racial justice will create more division? Uh, Tasha, we're gonna start with you. All right, thank you, Amy. And hey, Mark. <laughs> so I would say that talking about it leads to action, right? And for me to be silent equals consent. And so I believe that in order to change things at the very minimum, you have to be able to have that conversation um, to actively address it, right? To begin that work. Also, America was founded on division, right? So I would argue that division is baked into who we are as an American society. And I do believe that we can change. I do believe that, I have to believe that. I'm raising two black boys in America. So I have to believe that America can become better and so I think that we have to have those conversations, even if for some people they feel that it's uncomfortable. Thank you so much. Mark, same question. So I'm a firm believer that part of our issue is that we do not, our major issue is that we do not have enough of these conversations, that we do not practice actively engaging in dialogue, difficult conversations in general, but especially conversations around race and culture. It's because we don't practice having these conversations actively and consistently that we stumble in them. It's because it's the reason why people get frustrated, why people walk away and step away because they don't know how to stay in their discomfort and don't know how to engage fully in meaningful conversation. So I'm a firm believer that more conversation is necessary. The division has always existed. The only way to bridge that gap is to have meaningful dialogue and then turn that dialogue into action. So two things that I want to pick off from what you just said, um, thank you both for those responses, is that I'm, I'm excited that you included culture. So it's not just race, but also culture. Um, I was fortunate enough about a week and a half ago um, to visit for the first time the National African American Museum of Culture and History I did not have enough time. You need at least a full day there. So I, I do plan on going back and dedicating a day, but culture is so hugely important and shameless plug. If anyone was considering visiting, um, I definitely encourage you to do so. It is so beautifully laid out, so well done and so powerful. Um, yes. So our next question. How does the work, how does this work have the potential to reshape our communities and benefit all of us? And the reason I added that question to the list is that unfortunately I find that some of us have a zero sum mindset, right? Um, Heather McGee wrote a whole book about it. 
And so if you are benefiting or if you are advancing, that must mean that I am losing something. Something is being taken from me. So again, the question, and Mark will start with you first on this one, how does this work have the potential to reshape our communities and benefit all of us? Well, I mean, I think it's 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 a, it's about the education and understanding that just because I'm achieving doesn't mean there isn't room for you to achieve also. It's creating that balance, creating that equity so that everybody has access and opportunity. It's not about taking anything away from anyone. It's about making doors that have been closed to certain groups of people open to them as well, so that you have a fair and equitable opportunity. It is unfortunate that people have adopted that zero sum mindset that I'm taking something from you, partly because it implies that it's yours to begin with. And that's that's part of the issue is that ownership of something that isn't yours to begin with, that we've always catered to a certain population or a certain group. So the mindset is it's mine. So anytime someone from outside that group of population achieves, there is that perception that it is being taken away from this group that has always gotten privilege, always had access, always had opportunity as opposed to realizing that there is room for you to achieve and room for me to achieve also. But when you're not used to having to share or you're not used to anybody saying no to you, it feels like somebody is taking something away from you. But let's keep in mind, it wasn't yours to begin with. You have, we all have to compete for what we want and work hard for what we want. But access needs to be equitable. No, thank you. And I appreciate you introducing the idea of ownership and who owns access um, and who owns the ability for to achieve and to, to receive opportunities. All right, Ms. Fowl, same question. How does this All right. potential to reshape our communities? So I think, you know, by focusing on the work, right, we can improve our communities. Graduation rates go up, maternal health outcomes improve, the school to prison pipeline, right, we could eliminate that. Imagine if schools were fully funded, right? If schools were funded equitably, how that would improve our communities. And so it is possible to imagine a society and a community, right? Specifically Rock County where we're actually thriving. And that's what this work does. Um, so many things are tied to and rooted in systems of oppression that is really hard for us to understand how it impacts our daily lives and how it is so so it's so hard to think about like you know what by focusing on racial justice we could actually improve maternal health outcomes you don't always think about that but that is huge right and that's the conversation that has to be had when it comes to racial justice i think understanding how many things are actually tied to those things no, that's really good. Um, and I like the tangible way you framed that because instead of looking at racial justice work, which is important of how we can reshape our communities, like how can we save lives through racial justice work? Um, which is a great segue into our next question. What is needed to make racial justice work sustainable? And I know this will come up later, um, and I actually have a resource that speaks to it, which I was really excited to see that kind of idea uplifted, is that sometimes we get stuck in the conversation loop. We get really comfortable. So let me back up. Some of us are not comfortable having conversations about race, right? Some of us, I think, are too comfortable having conversations with by, about race. And by that, I mean, we get stuck in that comfortable, let's talk, let's discuss, let's identify, let's analyze, and we never move to action. Um, once we move to action, for me, the next question is, what needs to happen in order to make racial justice work and racial justice solutions sustainable? So Tasha, we'll begin with you. I think sustainability is very hard in any social movement, right? Because the people who, and I use this word loosely, leading the work, right? Because I think that we all are leaders in our own way. But it's really hard. The burnout is definitely real. 
um, I mean, we're here having a conversation amongst friends, right? Um, and this is a conversation that Amy, Mark, and I would have on any given day. Like we would just have lunch and have these conversations. And so to I say to make the work sustainable, right? It requires people to be honest about what needs to be done. It requires us to have more than just a few people, right? If you just randomly talk to people like, well, who are the organizations doing the work? You're going to hear of a few organizations. And then if you talk to those people who are in those organizations, they're going to tell you, I'm tired. We need more people to show up to do the work, right? And I mean, there's so much work to be done. And if we look at, for example, the Montgomery bus boycott, right? That wasn't a two-week bus boycott, right? You look at how long it took for them to make change and how committed people had to be. You had to be willing to lose your job, lose your livelihood, lose some friends. And that's what racial justice work is, right? It's not just the cute, let me post a square on social media. It's not just showing up to the rally. Who wanna run for public office? Who wants to be in positions where they could actually make change within our community? And I think that's what makes the work sustainable is people being all in, but also people being willing to risk it all is what makes the work sustainable. So it doesn't fall on just a few people. Yes. Um, so what I'm hearing from you is it takes sacrifice. Yeah. All right. Mark, same question. Um, what needs to happen in order to make this work sustainable? True investment. Okay. As Tasha talked about, it can't just be, I'm going to push something when it's convenient. I'm going to talk about something when it's easy. It's got to be about an equity mindset 24-7, 365. It's not just something that you do here and there. This is a conscious life. This is a lifestyle choice. And you do have to make some sacrifices. You do have to be committed to the cause. But we invest time and resources in the things that we truly believe in. So what I, from, from what I've seen, I've seen in this community, I've seen a lot of people who do it when it's convenient, when it's easy. What I haven't seen is a lot of people trying to do the heavy lifting when it's difficult on a day-to-day -day basis. So if this is truly something that you're about, we need more voices more consistently and all voices. It is. It, it can't continue to be just a few people stepping up all the time and then people growling behind them. I need people standing beside me, next to me, even taking the load off every once in a while and stepping up front because it is incredibly exhausting and emotionally taxing to do this work. It can be alienating, it can be isolating, and it can be lonely at times. So we need more people to invest more consistently and more fully in the work. We need more people to step in and step up and show that they actually believe. It's great that people want to post things on social media. That's wonderful and, and dandy, but that's not moving the needle. I need your action and your, I need your voice and your action and your movement. All right. So hold on to that thought, Mark, because we're going to start with you with the next question. And I think the next question helps us dig down um, into some of the responses that you just gave me for the last question. Um, so the next question is, I believe that the people who are present for this discussion in this Zoom are what I call the willing, <laughs> which I see, you know, I work with the willing, whoever that is, whatever you look like, whatever your lived experiences are, if you are willing, I can work with you. Um, what is a good first step or maybe next step for people who are interested in expanding their personal and professional circles um, to include people with different lived experiences than they have. And then I want to tie that to your last response. Um, give us some tangible, let's focus on tangible things people can do and what does showing up look like? So for example, when you say take the load off, if a person approached you and said, um, do you need me to do this? Like, what would that this be that's impactful to you? Um, Tasha, you gave a specific example of running for public office. Um, that is not in everyone's wheelhouse. I get that. But if that's not a thing you can do, 
what can you do to support people who are willing to put themselves out there and run for office? And just so we're clear, as a reminder, YWCA Rock County is nonpartisan. Um, I know because we've done enough work together that Community Action Inc. is apolitical. So I want to be very clear on that. Um, so we're not telling you who to vote for or anything like that, but how can people engage in the process? And I want people to walk away with tangible examples um, of what that looks like. So Mark, we'll start with you. So it starts with a lot of people, people don't know what they don't know. So it starts with education. First and foremost, this is about educating yourself and preparing yourself to actually engage before you step in. Far, I mean, we have a lot of really good-hearted, well-intentioned people in this community, but good-hearted and well-intentioned does not automatically equate to educated and well-versed. So that's the first thing, is not relying on other people to educate you, not relying on other people to, to fill in the gaps. You have to do that for yourself. So that self-awareness, self-education piece. The second part is understanding your own biases, your own bigotry, your own stereotypes, everything that you bring to the table because so much of this work is about self. Once you've done those two things, then we're about stepping out and engaging. And some of that is as simple as taking that first step to have conversations with friends and family members. That if people, and not everybody's gonna run for office, not everybody's gonna do public speaking, not everybody's gonna do training and education, but everybody in this community has got a sphere of influence. So talking to the people around you, pushing them to educate themselves and helping them to educate is a huge step. Making sure that people are aware of what's going on, helping people understand that not everybody walks the world the way that they do. Giving people and helping people open their minds and helping people see things through more lenses than their own. Those are huge tangible steps, but it's got to start with that education and awareness. It is not my responsibility to educate you, it is your responsibility to educate yourself. And until people take that level of responsibility to do their own work, we're not, we're not going to move the needle anywhere. No, I agree. And and one thing I would I would like to add to those beautifully said comments is that people, all of us, um, the two words that came to mind were, were humble and grace. So if this is an area that is not, if this is an area that is new to you, be humble enough to understand that there are things that you are going to need to unlearn during that self-education process um, and be open and welcoming to receiving information and not defensive or um, becoming offended. Um, and then to people that if you know someone is, is, is trying and giving an earnest effort um, and they misspeak or they make a mistake that, that we have to be willing to offer grace and welcome people in and bring them in so that those conversations can continue and not be stunted. Um, Tasha, same question. What are tangible examples? Like, what can we leave our audience with? So they're like, all right, I, I know what a good first or next step is. I, I agree with Mark. It has to start with the inner work. You know, Mark mentioned looking at your own biases. Absolutely. I would add to that to take a self inventory of yourself, right? Be reflective and be honest with yourself. Where are these points of pain, points of growth for you, points of, um, I don't know, right? Because um, I think that's important for you to be honest with yourself. And once you start there, right, then, then it allows you to show up in spaces differently, right? That allows you to show up in spaces and do less harm. So some concrete examples would be movies, right? Check out movies that star people who do not have the same lived experiences as you. You can do that at home, right? Um, books, concerts, restaurants, all of those are very easy points of access for you to be in a space, whether it's through a movie, whether it's transporting your mind through a book of looking at lived experiences of people that may be different than your own, right? Um, and I would encourage people not to rush this process. Don't say, hey, you know what? I watched uh, Dear Mama on Hulu. I'm ready to have a tough conversation, right? No, it's okay. 
it's okay to watch dear mama to reflect and learn and be like, wow, I didn't know this. And why didn't I know this? What more can I learn about, you know, the movements that were addressed in this wonderful documentary, right? And I would say, as you're going through this personal journey, understand for people on the other side, nobody wants to be friends with someone that's going to do harm. No one's going to sign up to be like, oh, let's do this great project and work together when it is a place that is not safe and it does harm to that individual, right? Be intentional with building relationships. I always say relationships that are transactional are not relationships at all. So I think if you can be intentional with building meaningful relationships within this community, I think that that would allow you to learn more because now we have a basis. Now we have trust. Now we can talk about our shared experiences. Now I feel more comfortable talking about my lived experience because we have a baseline of understanding. No, perfect. Um, and for our next question, Tasha, we're going to start with you. So I'll go ahead and drop that in the chat. Um, in spirit of full transparency, I put this in there. Uh, not so much recently, but in the past, I've heard this a lot. Oh, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. I just see people. And that has always been deeply offensive to me. And I will explain in case anyone's interested after we hear from the two of you. Um, but the next question is, is being colorblind harmful? And how do you respond to individuals who believe we exist in a post-racial society? Um, i.e. a uh, familiar line many of us I believe have heard is we're not we don't have racism anymore like we elected Barack Obama twice um so Mark thank you for grabbing your face in exasperation uh Tasha we're going to start with you and then go to Mark is being colorblind harmful yes it is very very harmful to be colorblind I wake up every day in this body, right? I am a black woman living in America. And so if you're colorblind, then that says to me that you don't see me. You don't see the experiences that I have lived. You don't, um, you're missing so much about me, right? Um, and so my son actually had to write a paper about um, the myth of a post-racial society. And it was really dope talking to him about it because um, I'm a nerd, he's a nerd, so it was great. Um, and so for people who believe we live in a post-racial society, I would ask them, why do our driver's license still ask us to identify our race? Why do we do a census um, to, to identify race, right? The truth is that we don't live in a post-racial society, even though some people did believe that the election of Barack Obama, and that's where that conversation started of like, racism is over. It started with the election of President Obama, and we started hearing that rhetoric a lot. And the reason why we don't live in a post-racial society is because our life expectancies, right, our very trajectories can be predicted by race. We have the data to say what that looks like, right? And so please do not believe that we live in a post-racial society at all. It is definitely a very dangerous myth to believe that. Mark, same question. First of all, the whole concept of colorblindness is a myth. As I say to people all the time when they approach me with that, Mark, I don't see you as a black person, I just see you as my friend or my coworker. My response to them is, hold up. And I say that because if you didn't see the color of my skin, you wouldn't feel the need to say that to me in the first place. So don't pretend like you didn't see it or you're not seeing it. Because if you didn't see it and it wasn't there, you wouldn't approach me with that statement to begin with. It is a ridiculous idea. It does not exist. People absolutely see the difference. Acknowledge the difference. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging the difference. We're not the same. It's just the reality. So instead of pretending like something isn't there, acknowledge the difference and keep it moving. As Tasha said, and I tell people all the time, the color of my skin doesn't define me, but it is part of the definition. So you have to see the whole person. Denying an aspect of, of, of me is denying an aspect of my humanity. The color of my skin matters, it's relevant. So you have to see it. And as we talk about the post-racial society concept, 
as we and we talk about it in the context of Barack Obama, people people ignore the how people dismiss or ignore or choose not to talk about how ugly that 2008 election was, how biased and bigoted that 2008 election was in places like Kentucky and West Virginia, where people were openly talking about not wanting to vote for that N word. So don't give me probes racial. The way that the Congress, people in Congress acted towards the president of the United States because he was black. The way that people in the US Senate acted towards the president of the United States because he was black. So don't sell me post racial. Also, Tamir Rice, George Floyd, Sandra Bland, don't tell me about post racial society. It does not exist. We have not achieved and not come close. If anything, in the last decade, we regressed thoroughly. Message received. And the only thing I will add is that when, when people tell me that, I, I ask, what other parts of my lived experience are you also willing to dismiss or ignore? Because knowing that up front gives me an indication of am I willing to invest in this relationship? Um, so I want to circle back. Because I really get the sense that the intention behind the statement, I'm colorblind, I don't see color, I, you fill in the rest. I think for the most part, that comes from a good place. And I think this is a point for us to pause and kind of explain a bit more deeply how that facade of we're all the same, I don't see your color, how that is harmful. Because I think the intent is coming from a good place. And I think it's important for getting people to understand, I don't think you mean to, but you're causing harm. So I'll just open the floor if either of you want to um, add anything to that, that thought. So I'm just going to be honest with you. I stopped talking about intent a long time ago. I could care less what your intent is. Impact is what matters. If the impact of what you said or the impact of what you did is harmful, that's the thing you need to focus on. We need to start focusing more on addressing the impact of what comes out of people's mouths, whether they intended to or not is irrelevant to me, because the truth of the matter is, I don't really know what your intentions are, but I know what the impact is, that's real and tangible to me. So you can tell me you didn't intend to, you didn't mean to until you're blue in the face. I don't care, I'm paying attention to the impact. That's all that's relevant to me. Okay. Super facts, agree, because again, in, intent, how you feel can still cause real harm, right? Like, and I think that's important for people to understand. And also there were a lot of good, well-meaning people who attended lynchings as well, right? And so we gotta be clear when we talk about good, good is subjective. Just because you believe that you're a good person, right? You believe that your, your intent was, I was just asking. No, no, and no. Your intent does not reduce the amount of harm that is done to people. And that may be painful, that may be hard, but it's the truth. And I think in order to have these conversations, we have to continue to root ourselves in the truth and understand that your feelings could also result in great harm, even death for people who look like me. And that's very important to understand. Okay, so let me circle back. And then I think I'll be ready to leave this question with another nuance. I think my response, um, I, I have greater flexibility in my personal life to give you a response and move on. But in our professional lives, if these are colleagues, these are clients, these are customers, that you need to work with on the job. Is that interaction different in how you engage, explain, et cetera, um, when it comes to issues of intent versus impact? Uh, and answer may be no, but, but I wanna ask the question. Tasha, I'll start with you. I think that you cannot put clients and coworkers in the same category because there's a difference there. Um, because if we're working for the same organization, then I believe that any organization should have guiding documents when it comes to this, right? There should be clear-cut policies. There should be clear-cut practices. 
of what is acceptable in any organization and what's not. Clients, it depends on the clients that you serve. I believe that some people may work with young people, right? There's a lot of teaching moments that can happen there. I think some people may work with people of different abilities, and there's a lot of learning and grace that is given there. Um, and, and how you meet people and where they come in is always different. So as a, as a professional, and you're working in this field and you're tasked with doing this work, I believe that there is grace, right? There is grace that is given. However, depending on where you work, that could be a harmful and a hostile work environment for you as well. So I still think that it's the same. The intent doesn't lessen because it's a coworker or because it's a client. Um, and, and there is data to support this too in terms of people who are doing this work post 2020 and how many of them have left their positions because it has been harmful and hostile for them. And so they have left positions in which they were leading diversity, equity and inclusion work because of the conditions of their um, organization or um, place of employment. Mark, anything you would like to add to that? I would just say that, it, you know, I try to approach every situation like that as an opportunity to educate. So, and that it, it, but in the course of that education, the thing that I say to you may sting. The thing that I say to you may push you out of your comfort zone. The thing that I say to you may force you to, may cause you to think twice about what you said and about saying it again. It may cause you to think twice about approaching me but I'm going to give you the education that you need because it's the thing that I need to do. Because part of this too is about, you may say something to me and you know I may give you the education, you may say that thing to somebody else and you may get punched in the face. So better me give you the education now in this manner than you have something else more harsh happen to you later on because you approached the wrong person. But I'm a firm believer that the education must happen regardless. I've, I'm, I've been, in this, I've been in this work too long and I'm too old and I'm too tired to get to put up with a whole lot of chaos from folks. I just, um, I, I don't, I used to give people a lot of passes, I used to give people grace. I used to, I don't, and I still try, try to on a certain level, but quite honestly, I'm going to say to you the thing that I need to say to you that I, the thing that I think you need to know, because that is for my health and well being and for your safety and health and well being. I'm not carrying your stuff around with me anymore. So if you approach me with something and ask me, so if you make a misstep, yes, I'm going to try to educate you in a manner that you clearly understand it so you don't make that misstep again. But it may land for you in a way at the, in the moment that doesn't feel good. Quite honestly, at this point, too bad. When I approach adults, especially adult professionals, my expectation at this point is that you have a level of competency and humility. And if you don't, you better get it. When it comes to youth, that's about education because they don't know what they don't know. I have an infinite amount of patience when it comes to working with educating and talking to youth. But my expectation for adults, especially adult professionals, especially people who work in this field, that if you are not culturally aware and you're not competent, you better be working on it. Because you can't work for me, do you can't work for me like that. I'm sorry. It, you will, I will not allow your lack of competency to harm the people that we serve. Absolutely not. So either I'm so I'm going to provide you an opportunity to educate you, and then once the education happens, then comes accountability. But your lack of competency is not my problem. It's your problem. And that's the issue. Is people need to own their stuff. Your ignorance is yours. So educate yourself. Or I will. Message received. Um, and I am a fan of boundaries. <laughs> so I, I I was appreciating uh all of that response. All right. So our next question. Racial justice work, as we've been discussing, um, can be both draining and inspiring sometimes simultaneously. Um, we are probably familiar with negative impacts of stress. Uh, how are you intentional about maintaining your mental and physical health while engaging in racial justice work? Um, Mark, I believe we're starting with you on this question. For me, it is about continuous education, continual, continuing to read, 
continuing to study, to continue to learn and continuing to grow, it's absolutely necessary. Part of this is for me too, is about reading about the experiences of others, talking to others about their experiences, engaging and interacting and talking about shared experiences that we have so that I'm not, I know that I'm not alone in the universe. That is incredibly uplifting. Also, doing the work when I know light bulbs come on for people in the spaces that I'm doing the work, that is also incredibly uplifting. When you know, when you see somebody have an aha moment and you're like, oh, that person got it. That, that makes this day worth it, or that makes this three hours worth it, or that makes everything that I've gone through this week worth it. That's the other uplifting part. But people also need to understand that this is not just an intellectual pursuit, that there's a lot of emotion tied into what we do, because we still experience the things that we talk about on a consistent basis. When I come and talk to you about racial discrimination, or I talk to you about driving while black or being followed around a store while black or poor service that I get in a, in a restaurant because I'm black. Those are all things that some people think of as, well, that's other people's experiences. And we're just talking about examples of race. Those are things that happen to me on a daily basis. So understanding as I'm talking to you about these circumstances to educate you, I am also reliving experiences that happened to me. I'm, re I'm experiencing the trauma that happened to me over and over again. And that is the draining part of it, is that this is more than just an intellectual pursuit for me. This is heart and soul. This is a part of my life. This is me ultimately trying to create a safe space for myself and a safe space for people who look like me. I share my experiences in the hope that other people that look like me don't have to go through what I've gone through. So if I can educate enough people, maybe I can prevent something from happening that happened to me. I love the idea and I've never looked at it that way of like I get self-care, but that hit differently for me, creating a safe space for yourself within the context of this work. Um, I think that's huge. Tasha, same question. So for me, my parents raised me to believe that God will protect me, right? And, and I believe that, like my faith has, and it will continue to sustain me. That's a huge part for me. Um, but also shout out to therapy. Um, that's very important. Um, I encourage everyone to try therapy and try it again and keep on trying therapy. Um, I'm also super heavy on praying for peace and understanding. I have a great village of people who continue to uplift me each and every day. That makes a huge difference for me. They make sure that I am better than good, right? I have friends who check on me. They may send me a text, a song, a movie. We may go on walks. Um, my sons and my nephews send me hilarious TikToks, right? To make me watch and laugh. I'll hop on FaceTime with my sister and we will do nothing. And sometimes we just laugh so hard that we're like, I have to get off the phone with you. So I invest in myself. I allow people to fill my cup because I need that. And so even though it can be draining, it's also important for me to center myself. You know, um, like Mark said about creating a safe space for yourself. I look for the people who are willing to help uplift me and to encourage me, right? To say, hey, nope, I got you. I'm gonna hold you up. I'm gonna be here to support you. The friends who ask, what do you need? What can I do? That's very important for me. No, I love that. And as you were talking, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Like it, it takes a village to maintain your sanity. Um, so so <laughs> I love that. Okay, um, I got so stuck into listening to the response. I didn't queue up the next question. So please forgive me. Um, let me go through that. All right, next question. And then we are gonna open it up for Q&A. So in just a moment, if you are interested and available, I would um, welcome everyone to turn their cameras back on. I'll let you know exactly when. Um, and then I have a couple questions that I've seen in the chat and we'll do those first. Um, so if you do have a question, either put the question in the chat or put a question mark, and that'll let me know that I need to call on you so you can unmute and share. Um, so the final question that I have for each of you, and Tasha will begin with you, um, what are some of your short and long-term goals 
with respect to racial justice. And this could be either personal or professional or a mix of the two. So Tasha, we'll start with you. I think short-term goals for me include continuing to show up, right? Um, continuing to build bridges and not walls. That's very important. Um, continue to do the work um, from where I am in terms of my position in Rock County. I think that's a short-term goal for me. Um, I do have some community involvement, things that I am involved in. I am the secretary for our local NAACP. I'll continue to do that work. That's very important for me. Um, Long-term goals, that was a little harder for me to think about. Um, but in an ideal world, I would have more time, right? I could be more committed to other community organizations. So long-term goals, I would like to be able to do that. Um, but I'm also a parent and that is very important for me. So I have to balance what that looks like. But long-term goal, and Amy, this is going to be hilarious because I want to see your face when I say this long-term. And this is like long-term, long-term. So Amy, do not call me like, be like, I heard you say this super long-term, very far down the road. Eventually I would like to run for a political office, but that is super duper, <laughs> very long-term. That will not be in the near future, but eventually that is on my list of things to do. Tasha, you know me well enough to know that I have just like mentally tucked that away in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and we will one day, you know, look, I'm gonna let you come to me and let's say, you know, go. Okay, that's gonna be our code word. Now everyone knows it. But when you come to me and just say go, then that's the conversation we will have. But that is very exciting. Um, hopefully Mark will have similar an, an, a similar announcement to make. <laughs> Mark, the floor is yours. What are some of your short and long-term goals? Um, with respect to racial justice, that can be personal, professional, or a mix of the two. So I'll share one with you that's very personal first, and it it's the goal I start with out, out with every day when I leave my house, and that goal is to make it back home that evening. Because as a Black man in this country, that is not always guaranteed. So that is always my first and foremost. I worry about about that from the moment I leave my house to the moment I get back to my doorstep every single day. That is my goal. And that goal expands to everybody who looks like me, everybody, who, every young black man, every young black, young black lady, every young brown, young man, young lady in this country, that they make it back home. They make it when they leave their house in the morning to go to school, to go to work, to whatever, that they make it back home safely because it is, we've had too many instances in this world, in this country where that has not happened and it is certainly not guaranteed. So I always start my day with that, with that thought and I end my day with that thought. I step back in my, across my threshold and I take that deep breath before I walk up my stairs because I survived another day. The other short term uh, every day is to try to have, have an impact or an influence on someone, educate, influence, uplift every single day have a dialogue with somebody that needs it and be that person that gives them the, the thing that they need in that moment to keep them moving. So I strive to find that every single day as well. Um, Long-term, I do not have political aspirations. <laughs> um, it is, my long-term goal is to be able to, to, to be able to continue to educate until the moment that I'm not walking this earth any longer. Every morning that I wake up is an opportunity to educate and uplift and enlighten. So my long-term goal is to do that as long as I possibly can, to run as fast as I can for as long as I can and support and save as many people as I can. So Mark, I'm going to admit your, your initial response kind of sucked the air out of my lungs a little bit. Um, mm. Thank you for grounding us in that reality. All right. Um, wow. So I have some resources for us and then we're going to get to the questions and then we're going to do, um, our per post conversation survey. Um, so the, the question that we're actually not going to answer now, but I do have a resource for you. I want to start with that one first. Um, someone put in the chat, what would equitable school funding look like? 
um, which is an amazing question. I'm going to drop just a resource in the chat. Um, it's called Cracking the Code to Funding Schools Equitably. So please click on that as you have an opportunity, um, and hopefully that information will be helpful to you. Um, the question that I do want us to get to, how can those of us in nonprofit leadership, which is histor historically led by white males, help advocate for a more diverse leadership and help our BIPOC colleagues receive promotions and join the leadership circles? Um, Mark, you want to handle that question? You have to be conscious about your recruitment practices, your hiring practices, and your staff development. So I was looking at a stat the other day. So there are 1.7 million nonprofits in this country. 93% of those nonprofits are headed by white people. The, it, it is, it's astounding to me that, uh, that it's a stat that just threw me back because it means that I'm an anomaly. It means that I am, I am, you know, I, I am the exception and not the rule, not even close to the rule and an and, and, and extreme exception. So how do we work on those? How do we recruit people into this work? How do we retain them in this work? And then how do we create pathways to success so that people can be promoted within organizations? Because I've worked for a number of nonprofits over the years and what I've seen and run into over and over again is the glass ceiling. Black and brown folks on the front lines as case managers, but never getting promoted to coordinator positions, management positions, directors positions. But they're the people who they're, they're asked to deal with the black issues and the brown issues. I need you to come translate for me. I need you to come deal with this person. There's a black person at the desk. There's a brown person at the desk. But and you get stuck in pigeonholes in those spaces of doing the direct work and never get the opportunity to advance. So we have to be more conscious about staff development and about staff advancement. The reality of it is, is that the majority of the US labor force is gonna be people of color by the year 2030. And if we do not start investing in, we're gonna have huge voids in our professional spaces, both in the public sector and the private sector, both in the nonprofit universe and for-profit universe. If we don't start consciously developing black and brown folks to step into leadership roles, there are going to be leadership voids all over the place. People have to understand that our population is changing. And if or entities and institutions don't start evolving, institutions will die. Well said. All right. So with our remaining 10 minutes, I welcome anyone who is interested. Go ahead, turn on your cameras, join us. Um, virtually slash kind of physically in this space. Uh, again, if you have additional questions, either put your question in the chat and we'll address that or put a question mark in the chat and I'll know to call on you. Um, as we are making that transition, there are just a couple of resources I wanted to make sure that I included in the chat. Um, one, in preparing for this conversation with these two amazing people, um, I was not aware of this. So the DOJ has a pretty lengthy document. I mean, it's called the U.S. Department of Justice Community Relations Service Dialogue on Race. And it's like a protocol and a format and what you should be talking about and how you can Influ initiate and influence these discussions. So I found it to be interesting. Um, if anyone wants to click on that in, in your free time and explore that document, um, you may find it interesting as well. And you know, I love a good book. Um, so I have two recommendations for the group. Um, the first one, I think it was released on Valentine's Day. So this is my Valentine's gift to myself, um, is Racial Justice at Work. Um, Practical Solutions for Systemic Change by Mary Frances Winters um, and the Winters group team. Some of you may be familiar with her. Um, she is also the author of Black Fatigue, um, which I recommend that as well. And then my other book recommendation for you um, is just that Black Fatigue. I'm trying to get it to, to upload in the chat, but give me a second. It is not cooperating. Um, so with that being said, are there any questions of our panelists? All right, Antonio, please go ahead and unmute. We are the Ku 
I apologize for that. O Lobão. I have removed him uh, and I'm going to go ahead and click on submit a report. Um, is there anyone else who has mm, a question for our panelists? Okay, um, someone is attempting to speak and is muted. Let me deal with that. If you have a question, go ahead and put in the chat. All right, Heidi, please go ahead and unmute. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so same, seeing some of the chat, yeah, it's unfortunate that people have to do what they do to um, negatively impact a positive conversation or a conversation that's moving forward. Um, however, so one of the questions I have for the both of you is, so I grew up, you know, in a very multicultural environment and I'm learning, right? Living now in the Midwest, some things that were appropriate where I grew up are not as appropriate here, you know, because um, where I grew up, I was a majority, right? It was like 80% not white and 20% white, right? Now I'm in the Midwest, it's kind of a flip-flop and something that we use quite, um, you know, Something that we would say um, growing up in Hawaii is we do refer to like a melting pot, you know, a melting pot. I don't know if we, um, and I've heard kind of varying opinions on like the word melting pot and how we use it, like, you know, on the continental US. Um, Tasha, Mark, do you have any comments on like when you hear things like melting pot, appropriate use of that word, how that might impact, or have you heard anything about it at all? Yeah, I mean, I grew up hearing about the great American melting pot. It was something that was talked about publicly. It was something that was advertised. It was something that was talked about during Saturday morning cartoons. The reality of it is, is this country has always been way too segregated to be a melting pot. So I, I've never, in my adult life, I've never bought into it and I've never believed in it. Um, we, we separate and we separate consciously and we separate purposely and we separate harmfully. It would be really wonderful if we had ways that we engage and connect with each other more consistently. Um, if we didn't have communities that were largely segregated, if we didn't have schools that were still largely segregated, if we didn't have um, representation that was disproportionate, in our, especially in our leadership positions and our political roles. Um, melting pots mean that you have a mixture of people. And what I see is, especially in places where decisions are made and positions of power and control, I see a very homogeneous monolithic um, circumstance. So the, the melting pot thing is a nice thing to talk about, but it does not exist in reality. and It's never existed here. So I'm going to jump in. Um, and I want to say one of the ways that you know you are having an impact is when people try to shut it, shut it down or to pollute it, or to interject. Um, so Mark, I'm sure what you just said was brilliant. I missed every syllable of it because I am removing people and deleting posts, um, but I trust that it was brilliant, so thank you. Um, I hope that everyone sees this as encouragement. One validation that racial justice work is so critically relevant and important, um, and two, we need to continue to do that work. So as I continue to um, remove and delete, uh, is there anyone else who has a question? Um, this may be the last one um, for Tasha or for Mark. All right. So with our remaining three minutes, and I may have one more opportunity to ask if there are any questions, but while I have you all together, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that Juneteenth is coming up and I wanted to share our save the date. We are hoping that many, if not all of you are able to join us. Um, so I'm gonna drop the link to the PDF in the chat. 
if you just need a graphic, I will also put that in there. Um, but we will again be joining with the Elite Ladies of Beloit at Telfer Park from noon until 10 on Saturday, June 17th. Um, there is still chances available um, if you are interested in sponsoring a booth, if you are a nonprofit, there is no fee for the booth, um, because as we honor and recognize the end of chattel slavery in the United States, we want to make sure that we are um, being intentional about connecting community members with vital services that they need. So if you are a nonprofit organization that would like to have a booth at Juneteenth, please just send me a quick email and um, I'll send you the paperwork to get you signed up. Now, while our food and product vendors are going to be there from noon until 10. That is not the expectation of our nonprofit um, partners. So usually they clear out around five and that is absolutely okay. All right. Um, we do have time. Final call for anyone in the meeting. If you just want to um, unmute and express gratitude for our panelists, or if you have a question for them, um, let me know you are interested in sharing by either raising your hand or put a question mark in the chat. No, I'm not going to be shy. Um, my name is Gail Graham, and I am so appreciative of you guys for doing this. Um, I'm really angry, so my voice is shaking. But this is why we do this. And it's important, and thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. And I would just say on a personal note, I, I don't think all of us realize how much just a word of encouragement um, is really helpful. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all right, there's appreciation in the chat. So our panelists, please make sure that you glance at that before we leave. We have reached one o'clock and the end of our discussion. And I'm so grateful um, to Tasha and to Mark and to all of you for joining us. Um, thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. The recording of this will be available on our YWCA Rock County YouTube channel shortly. So please do rewatch um, and, and share the recording. <laughs>